All right. Welcome everyone into a new episode here of the College Dodgeball Podcast. I am Kevin Bailey, uh, Chief of Content for the NCDA, and today I am joined by Michigan Dodgeball Cup champion, uh, Kevin Wynn, coach of the Michigan State Spartans, one of the coaches, one of the many coaches. Uh, welcome, welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, and congratulations on, on three straight MDCs. Honestly, that's the first topic that we're going to get into. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff. We'll, we'll talk about MDC. We're going to get some predictions from you on, on Ohio Dodgeball Cup, and I know that you've played some Ohio teams this year, so you probably got a good good grasp of how that's going to go, and then we'll talk about more. We'll, we, maybe we'll touch on the NDA, Michigan State's women's team, and then we have some uh, fan questions. I don't know if they should be called <laughs> fan questions. But eboard questions for... <laughs> for you so anyway yeah. let's start with michigan dodgeball cup how did you think it went what was your uh, overall takeaway on the whole event yeah i think it went well um obviously we knew our first three matches were going to be what they were so it's kind of just getting to that last match um mdc is always a weird thing for us where for the longest time everyone on the team felt like we were kind of cursed there we'd have our best team and just constantly went zero and three zero three zero three yeah. Finally got a breakthrough with Peyton, got a first couple of wins, um, and then just kind of built upon that. Even our first MDC win when we went down 0-3, so that felt like curse was still there. Um, but we stormed back, got that, and it's just been a whole new um, energy about it. Oh, yeah, big time. It's uh, It's kind of funny to think that rookies coming into the league now don't even probably don't even know about the like losing streak now it's just michigan state wins mbc every year which is so different as a grand valley alum i don't love that but also that's that's the way it goes is like a different team sort of takes over and has their their run and like right now any any rookie this year or, or next year even is going to know nothing different than yeah, michigan state that's, wins every year it seems yeah that's the like expectation going forward so um, hopefully they don't have to think about it. We've been through what we've been through and it's right. aiming, aiming to win it now. Always, always coming from behind. I'm pretty sure it's each of the last three times. Is that right? Yep. yep. Okay. Cause all went through the, the first year down two one and a half this year. I don't remember what it was last year though. I don't Maybe remember last years. year either. Yeah. We were, uh, on the broadcast, we were kept mentioning that it was three straight times that that happened, but I was, I was trying to remember last year's. But anyway, for this year, what did you say? What was the adjustments at halftime? Because it was two to one. Yep. And then you guys really just controlled the second half. Yeah. So first point, we kind of took pretty easily. We came or we played Saginaw um, a little harder than we probably needed to. But that was just to get ready for that championship match. Right. Um, had that really high with Eric's hit on. Uh, who was it? Darnell for that first point. And then the energy kind of dropped off a little there. Um, execution dropped a little off, and then we just had to get it back at halftime. It was actually um, Jack Gerling who came up to me with um, some suggestions and that group of guys that helped me make those adjustments. And wow. we really took off from there. I love it. The one thing we – so I – mentioned this to you really quick when you came up to the the booth area at MDC, but it was kind of, this was the first time I saw MSU live in person. I watched like a little bit of some streams, I think like a game against Cincinnati and then Grand Valley and UWP early in the season. But the amount of new players, like, like we know, we know a handful of them, but a lot of the young players, it, it was kind of like one of those Look at all these just nameless players that are all better than you would expect them to be for being so young. And it seems like that's the story of this team, whereas last year you had the core four, as we call them, mm -hmm. and like they were the big name players and all that. Um, and you had like that top end that was really, really good. And you still have a good top end. The uh, Fido obviously is, is great, and Baraball is also. I feel like those are the top two. Maybe you disagree. Maybe you, I guess you probably won't tell oh, me. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but at, like those two are great, but it seemed like 
last year you had like so many seniors this year is a younger team and also it, it feels like the the depth of the team has kind of picked up the slack compared to in years past even last year yeah for sure i mean we had the core four last year that we lost uh, we lost another senior starter uh, we essentially lost alec this year so we had a lot of right space or spots we had to replace um the expectation was never to go undefeated again last year we felt we had the team to do that um but this year we we, we hit some little bumps um and it's all in the, the, the development of these guys and just working in um we set ourselves up well with drills and we don't play that many games because we have other things going on that help us grow so um i think it's starting to pay off uh we're not nearly as good as we'll be at the end of the year hopefully um, but as long as we keep at it, I think we'll be in a good spot this year. So one of the topics that I definitely wanted to talk about was the recruiting, which Michigan State does so well at and, and so consistent, which is the key. The key is not to have one great recruiting class and then flop the next mm-hmm. two years. What really makes a, a program great is when they can do it year after year, and Michigan State has definitely cracked the code on that recently. But then also the development, which, like I was just talking about, all those young guys that are no-name people, I know a lot of their names now, but prior to, you know, like mid-season, a lot of those players are not, like, well-known players. Yeah. But all of the young guys on this team, even the rookies, are developing rapidly. And, and that's why I said at the first tournament of the year for you guys when you lost to Grand Valley is that you can't count out Michigan State because of, the opportunity for growth that they have is, is so much higher than a lot of other teams with how young they are. So what goes into you guys developing your, your players better than most other programs right now? Yeah, for recruiting, it's all about getting bodies in the door at first. Uh, we're competing with uh, a lot of other clubs trying to get people there. Um, and then getting them there is one thing, but keeping them there is another. Um, the first three weeks of the year. We're not even letting our guys pinch. We're not really letting them play. It's just about making it fun for those guys and wanting them to, or making them want to come back. Um, I think that goes a long way, especially in the second semester, we lose half of our gym. So we know we generally lose, have to go in strong. Um, but we just make it all about them and then getting them hooked really early with the tournament um, goes a long way. Yeah, that's definitely something I always say. I know when I talked with Wes on the podcast, we talked about that too, is getting that early fall tournament that really buys them in. Because mm-hmm. if you're in a, like, if you're just going to dodgeball club a couple nights a week, it's one thing. But then once you go to yeah. that tournament, everything changes a little bit. It's definitely how it was for me my first year. And for I sure. feel like every recruiting class, that's where it clicks and you know who's going to stay and who might. Yeah, kind of fade from there, but your chances are so much higher once you get them mm-hmm. in a uniform or just out there on the court for an actual game. So my suggestion is, if you can make it a a travel a traveling tournament where you go overnight, that also goes a long way. Big um, time, hundred percent. Connect and make friends, and it's just not a quick one day tournament. Right. That's yeah. Like home tournaments are great. There's so many benefits to that, but mm-hmm. getting that road tournament in the fall, especially early in the fall, um, getting the buy-in of those younger players. Once, once they have that weekend with the team, it's so much different. Like you're, mm-hmm. like you said, than than going on a Tuesday night from 7 PM till 9 PM and then going back home exactly. and doing homework. So yeah, I, I think that's gotta be a trend throughout the league. Honestly, is we need more events in the fall that, um, are highly attended and, to like the B team thing. I could talk about B team forever, but yeah. Fall tournaments where every team is trying to field a B team and just throwing all their rookies on a B team um and and seeing where it goes from there because that's going to keep them on board and keep them in the club, but yeah. Yeah, I always uh I don't know if I ever ended up proposing it, but I was wanted to was just expanding rosters early in the year um and allowing us to bring more people. Because if you travel to other schools, they don't generally generally want you to bring a B team um, or allow you to bring a B team. So just expanding it to even 24 lets you keep that recruiting going and uh, locks them in even more. Right. It, um, 
Yeah, that's an interesting one. It it definitely creates an imbalance in like when you're going to a four four game tournament, a team that's able to bring twenty four. Now there's even more of that imbalance and um, advantage that comes with it because you're able to rest even more because you got so many other other players. But the benefits of it as well, you can't um, you can't ignore the benefits. Um, so yeah, I I was thinking recently, another thing would be some sort of rule where early in, I don't know if this is a rule or not, but early in the season, if if you can have six of your 18 even that are on varsity also get to play on, on a B team. And maybe that's a fall semester rule where yeah. then all of a sudden you're going to a tournament and um, yeah, those, those six rookies potentially that are, are bench players will be starting on the B team, obviously. And then you have that overlap and you don't have to have a full, full two teams at first. And it still gives you the ability if you aren't able to get a two, two full teams, you're able to have like a team and a half and get all of them, all of the action that, that you could possibly get. So mm -hmm. there's a bunch of different, I think that there should be some rule proposals surrounding that because any, anything that takes away the friction for teams to be able to get more players playing time early in the season is probably going to be worth a discussion with, yeah. with how low a lot of club numbers are right now. But yeah. anyway. Yeah. If we, I mean, if you can keep more players running, it just, expands um, potential of the league. Um, I heard you Radham Maker as an example. When he first joined the team, probably didn't make roster, probably wasn't going to make roster for a while. And through practice, hard work, he got to a point where he's there on the court, took that opportunity um, and just ran with it, got better at things and just you have to play him now because he's made us play him. Um, if we can right. keep those players around that quit after first cuts or Whatever it is, um, it just goes a long way. So he was a rookie last fall. Yeah, uh, he was a rookie. Let's see, last year. Yep, he was the last rookie yeah. last year. Um, didn't make the first couple rosters. I'm pretty sure. Um, and if <laughs> he made starter by the end of the season, I think he started the national championship game. Um, just working his butt off. He didn't wow. have a good role. His role, honestly, was just to go grab balls and bring it to Barry, bring it to Jack. And he used right. that as an opportunity to look for catches and just kind of um, yeah, earn more playing time. This is a, that's a good segue into my last thing I wanted to talk about MDC was you shouting out some of those players that maybe don't get as much recognition. He was definitely one that stood out to me at MDC. That, like, not a shot at him, but he was a nobody last year. He wasn't yeah. even on our radar. Um, mm -hmm. where you had those uh, handful of rookies that were really good last year, and he was not one of them. And now you look at, um, I think, Swanson. Swanson was a rookie last year too, right? Yep, yep, yep. So, so but now, like, you're looking at the sophomore class at MDC this year, and so many of them are key contributors, whereas, like, we, we weren't saying their name. Tony and I weren't saying their name that much when, when we were commentating games. So yep. Now you're saying their name all the time. Rademaker's making all these great catches or – Mm -hmm. Swanson, who's like now kind of taking over Barry's role in the middle, it looks like, yep. at least partially. But yeah, uh, so who are the who are those guys that you think need a shout out? Could be a rookie. Could be a rookie that doesn't play at all yet. Who, yeah. Who are your uh, honorable mention people to shout out right now? Yeah. So I'll shout out Thomas. Like we just switched him to middle two weeks ago. Um, we moved Nick right, Thomas middle, and he was just in my ear for two straight weeks, just asking what to do and how to perfect that role. So he gets, he, he deserves a lot of credit um, and he's only going to get better there. So I'm excited to see that. Um, obviously for rookies, we've had Eric making big plays. Um, yeah. yeah, he's got it. Edson is uh, probably going to be mm -hmm. up there on the rookie list as well. Um, he made some really good catches. Um, really smart plays and yeah. just stuck to our system perfectly. Yeah. Yeah, both those guys were good. Um, which, which, uh, uh, we'll talk about that later. I was going to go into the Lumberjacks. Uh, was Edson one of the guys that was on Lumberjacks? Yeah, he, uh, he was, he was uh, on the Lumberjacks, got beat up the first day, came back the second day, right. and did a lot better. So, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit, but yeah, good for him. Yeah. 
uh yeah and then eric rap is definitely really good well yeah he's gonna he's gonna get um all rookie unless something crazy happens oh, uh, yeah. I'd i be think shocked. it's a three-man race for probably rookie of the year okay let's hear your take on that yeah I, and it has to be eric and alex in that conversation in my opinion and at kent um i want to say his name is bunch from uh ohio state ohio state yeah really good really good from what i saw that day um excited to see him play again um but he he was outstanding that day okay yeah no i, I keep on hearing his name um part of that's the osu people that are in the eboard channel and they're they're hyping him up but uh yeah definitely from what i watched he looks like he's he's gotten it's it's so easy to tell sometimes when someone yeah. just like everything naturally... he was doing that day made sense in terms of yeah. what, he, what the goal was and just making right. it play so good on him i'm sure there's some east coast guys that are really good penn state jmu jmu always has good good rookies so yeah um there's definitely plenty of time to figure that out uh i ohio i don't remember his name terrence check was talking talking up one of one of their guys as being like the hardest thrower on their team right now and he's a rookie so I'm excited to watch ODC because I want to see that. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, loads of rookies that are kind of in that running still. Several on Michigan State definitely are in that um, in the running as far as I'm concerned. Uh, maybe I'm a little bit biased because that's the only tournament I've seen in person yeah. so far. But who knows where that's going to go? And I'll give a um, shout out to um, Budai, the the new Budai, uh, Matt. No, uh, Michael. Yeah, Michael. Um, he made an incredible catch against Bearable. In yeah, he had, he had a good game. Yeah, that was insane. Yeah, that was crazy. I, I remember seeing it and thinking, what's, his, what's he doing? And then he somehow caught it. Um, yeah, that was a crazy moment. But yeah, props to you guys for turning the tide on that game. Beetle, I know he's in the background somewhere, but he also had a great game. I feel like you said you had just moved him to whatever the right side, but whether it was it was a uh, Budai or Ben Smart or whoever was over there, he seemed to have the upper hand on them in the second half, definitely. And I think that that was like a big turning point too. But yep. so, yeah, so Nick yeah. he was our right side last year, uh, especially when Alec went down with his injury. He took that spot over with Josh, and we just moved him back. And he's seems much mm -hmm. more comfortable there. Made a lot more plays. Stayed in a lot more. Um, okay. Really proud of him for that one. Yeah, I love it. Um, final thoughts on NBC. What do you th like? We we're talking about how NBC doesn't have the, uh, you know, the draw that it used to in terms of how exciting it is and all these games. What do you think? Is that going to change at some point? Where do, Central Michigan's got all these young players. Hopefully, that turns into them being a great team again. Yeah, I mean, probably in the next couple of years, Central will probably take that third spot unless WMU and SVSU want to start recruiting again. It's disappointing yeah. to see them showing up with less than 12, let alone less than 18, but um, right. yeah. hopefully they can get it together, get some recruiting in, um, and bring us back to where we where used to be. I know. Yep. I would I would like that as well. Tell me about it. But in, it's not even a shot just at the current captains or anything for that team. Like They, yeah. they both have had to chip away and try and build up their rosters again. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully yeah. eventually that happens. Central Michigan with so many new recruits and yeah. it sounds like they're just gonna continue to hammer recruiting their I'm I'm pumped for Central Michigan. Yeah. I I'm excited. They brought twelve, you know. Yeah. Um just gotta keep at it. Uh there's probably some things they gotta change around, but Oh yeah. <laughs> in terms of like so they gotta all right. If they're listening, you gotta get out of that gym. You gotta get for your practices, you gotta get out of the gym. Um, they play with 35 foot throw lines. That's not going to work. You guys have to get out of that. Um, the, the wooden gym or whatever it is. Yeah. It's like, the, yeah. uh, I hate that place. MAC. <laughs> it's like an oval and it's just not going to help you guys grow. Um, and then warm ups. you guys have a warm up. They're getting ready for our match and just standing there. I was Ooh. trying I was like, please warm up. <laughs> All right. Wow. So please from a former chip. Please yeah. get it together. Reach out if you guys need help. Plenty of alumni here to help you as well. Right. Yeah. I know Bryce said he's going up there every once in a while. Uh, I think that's probably going to help him a lot too. Yeah. So. 
All right. Um, anyway, yeah, once again, congrats on the Michigan Dodgeball Cup. Three in a row is, is pretty impressive. Even with it, it being some of the teams are down, it's still at minimum been two of the best teams in the country every single year. So winning MDC still, in my opinion, is the second most valuable besides nationals. Maybe this year is different. Maybe mm-hmm. ODC is passing MDC from that like top end standpoint, but we won't know that until nationals anyway. Yeah, but until they can segue, kick us, us and GVR the national national game, right? Yeah, yeah. they they once that is proven, then we can have that discussion, I guess. Exactly. Segwaying though, Ohio Dodgeball Cup is this weekend. Probably a lot of Ohio people listening into this. Uh, this is going to be live before the weekend. Um, so, let me hear your thoughts on ODC. I had sent you the schedule. They are doing the just like right. a eight team bracket, and then. A loser's bracket and stuff like that. But yeah, single elimination. Who you think's winning? Teams. Was that wrong? No, I think it's only eight. Oh, I thought last year they had more than eight, but I, I could just be wrong. Let me think if there was a team that might have gone defunct. I'm not sure. No. I could. I think it, like I said. Um, unless they allowed B teams last year, that's the only other thing, but I, gotcha. I doubt it. Yeah, so let's see. Round one, I think UC handles Cleveland pretty easily. Um, Kent versus Miami is going to be an interesting one. Um, Miami, before what last week or whatever they beat OSU, I would have said Kent. They've made a lot of progress um, and gotten a lot better this year, just playing NDA, playing as much right. teams as they have. Um, they've made incredible progress. I think I'm leaning towards Kent there. Yeah. Um, okay. Wow. And then Ohio should be Akron. Uh, OSU should be BGSU. So BGSU, we played them our first game. They have a lot of potential. Um, a lot of here. good players. I think they just need to put it together, all together, and for right. 50 minutes. Tough draw for them, too. I'm yeah. surprised you you picked Kent State over Miami after Miami just beat Ohio State, but um, I also see your your stance on that. Kent, yeah. so Kent I've actually seen Miami really play. Uh, I haven't watched them this year, at least, um, but I've seen Kent okay. from where they were the first time I saw them to them playing us to where they are now. They've just made a lot of good right. movement, and I'm excited to see them continue to grow. Uh, but that said, I think UC also beats them to make it to the finals. OSU beats Ohio, and in the finals, it's a tough one. Um, I'm going to say UC pulls it off for a third straight year. Ooh, nice. It seems like the common pick is Ohio State right now, and it's hard to mm-hmm. bet against them. And rightfully so, but. Yeah, but it'd be interesting. It'd be spicy if, if Cincinnati can do that. I mean, they yeah. didn't. West wasn't coaching the last time they played, and they had a, a a bad tournament. But maybe they turn it around. And we were talking before we we started recording about West said that they had a really good practice, and and he was feeling really confident. So I am yeah, I can't wait for that. If that's really excited matter. about this weekend, and I'm yeah. excited to see how it turns out. And you uh, you guys are going right? We're trying to. It depends on if we can find a sitter. If not, ah. but. So if you're listening um, and you want to help, <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be good to, yeah, I'm jealous that I'm not going to be there. I think it's going to be a really good tournament. I'm definitely going to tune in. Um, but yeah, the uh, next question, maybe it's, it's got, maybe you just answered it, but who do you think is the biggest threat to Michigan State the rest of the year? It's got to be GV. It's always got to be GV um, until... Someone knocks them off. It's always GV in us. I'd like to see um, Ohio State again. We want we're dying to play them again, but they've got to prove themselves more than this what they've done so far. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the uh, added questions that were thrown at me. Um, I'm gonna go to one of them right now, and that was talk about the improvement that you guys made between the OSU game and MDC and also what happened in the Ohio State game. Walk us through that, too. I want to hear – I think the world wants to hear some perspective on that game because if I'm not wrong, it was 4-0, right? 
Yeah, they took yeah. it to, took it to us three zero in the first half. Took the fourth point right after, and then I'm I'm pretty sure they put some subs in and yeah. we took the last two points, something like okay. that. Uh, but between Kent and now, we've just made some adjustments. Um, we needed our teeth kicked in a little bit. Uh, couldn't continue to ride the high from last year, right? We had, like we said earlier, we had a lot of buys to replace, so um, we just level set. Um, moved some people around and just got to work. Um, in terms of what happened that match, um, yeah, they just came. We had everyone. We had a team that we thought could beat them, and it just didn't happen. We came out flat. Uh, came out flat the whole day. Just wasn't ready to play. Mm -hmm. We gave up pretty uh, decent lead against JMU, I want to say. Whatever it was, it ended up in overtime. Yeah. Um, probably shouldn't have. We just didn't play our best dodgeball that day. Yeah. Yeah, nope. it's uh we have those guys, but we right. shouldn't show no better. Yeah. It's always sometimes it feels like just too easy to say, oh, we needed to lose to like refocus, but sometimes that's exactly what has to happen. Mm. It really yep. is, especially I mean, you guys coming off the national title and all that. Um and it worked, obviously, with the way that you, you all played last tournament. So, Yeah, we're hoping um, they yeah, go ahead. come to GV in the end of March, and hopefully we can get our rematch. If okay. not, Ooh, that'd play be awesome. them, play them. So a tournament at Grand Valley in March, is that set in stone or no? Uh, I think Mason's working on it. I don't think anything's set okay. in stone yet, but they're aiming for Here March 30th, I want to say. Okay. Ooh, yeah. So that'll be pretty much a, a nationals preview. If you can get Grand Valley, Michigan State, Ohio State there at least, then you're going to get some. You're going to get a preview of probably a final four or final match. Oh yeah. Uh, no, I think UC depending on might be interested as well. So throw them I mean, in there. They have title contention. JMU. Yeah. JMU, despite their record, is right there. Um, I'll give them credit. Mm -hmm. they, they put up good fights. They just got to turn yep. a couple of things around. Can't count them out. Got a little better, but they'll be right there too. Yeah, definitely can't count them out. Um, yeah, that sounds like if I'm any team that's in contention, I want to be at that tournament three weeks before nationals, two okay. weeks before nationals. Uh, otherwise, you're missing out. Two, I think, I think probably no, had some, three. some improvement. Know, yeah. But yeah, that'll be interesting. Okay. Let's uh, shift gears again. Actually, you know what? Let me let me go into the. Let's talk about NDA real quick. Yep. And also state of the NCDA. I want to get a big picture take from you. Where what do you think? Where do you think the league is at right now? What's good? What's bad? And then also let's talk about NDA a little bit in terms of the lumberjacks specifically because I think that what you what you guys did, whether it was the MSU coaches, whether it was the MSU captains, whoever decided, whether it was the freshmen on Michigan State's team that made that decision themselves, whoever made the, the choice in October for you guys to have a group of, of young core players to go to NDA Nationals to get their butts kicked most of the time, get way better by the end of the tournament, turn some heads by the end of the tournament, honestly. Yep. Um, that was so smart, and um, it was it was a uh, it was a great long term play because I saw a lot of those guys at MDC balling out, and they probably wouldn't have been doing as good if they didn't get that um, that experience early on. It would have just took longer for them to get developed to that point. So, talk me through that, and then yeah, state of the NCDA. If you have any any takes regarding that or things that you think should change, yeah. Um, so the lumberjacks, we start that came out as idea for. Um, Zach Van Fleet, he played with us, uh, Final Justice, uh, when we won that one round. I want to say Toledo, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but he wasn't really getting experience in the bracket play. So that kind of just sparked um, my brain a little bit and just like, let's get him good experience playing the same dodgeball. Get, like, he came back like, this was great. I understand I didn't play, but I want to get better. Um, so we were like, wow. all right, well, we got. You let's see if we can get a team together. We got Thomas for that, Rademacher, uh, Ben Hackman, Carter, mm -hmm. Eric, and Alex were actually there a month into dodgeball, I think it was. Um, yeah, uh, I don't remember who else was there, but 
Um, it was a good experience for them. They got their butts kicked the first day. I think they went, went winless. Um, and then the second day they came back, uh, did a lot better. So that's exciting to see. They gained a lot of experience. Um, and like you said, it's showing now. It's all those second year players you were talking about earlier. Um, uh, they they gained a lot of experience and they're going to show off for us this year. Yeah. The sophomore leap is definitely a real thing. Oh, yeah. In the NCDA. We always talked about that. Um, yep. And then we'll try to keep that team going um, this year. Um, probably replace a couple people. Um, but, and then actually add a couple more freshmen, I think could really do well there. So, um, nice. it's going to set us up for success this year, next year and, and beyond. Oh yeah. It's, uh, this is my analogy. It's, and I only say this because I played Monopoly recently. It's the difference <laughs> between having like a Monopoly and having Monopoly and then putting a hotel on it. Like Michigan State's got a bunch of good rookies. Great. That's really going to help Michigan State down the line. Oh, but on top of that, all of their good young players are also playing in the NDA now. Yep. It's just a cheat code for two years from now, how good those players are going to be in. For sure. any, any NCDA program that has the ability to get more players out there need to do their best to do, to do so because right now it's, it's in a really good spot where the NDA isn't like um, – there's no tiers yet to the NDA. It's not like we have a, a pro division and then an advanced division or whatever we would call it. Right now, everyone's playing everyone. So the Lumberjacks showed up and they got to get competition against, you know, whoever it happened to be, Kraken or Final Justice or whoever. Yeah. Um, and it just makes such a world of difference to get those reps. Yeah. I mean, playing teams even like uh, Precision, which they played twice, um, goes a long way for them. Like those guys weren't pinching too much, but they just had basic strategy that they could pick up. Right. Um, and stuff like that just that helps them grow and get experience. Yeah, totally. Um, and then state state of the NCDA. What what do you uh what are your thoughts right now on that? Yeah. So the state of the NCDA. I mean, I'm always rooting for it to keep growing. Um. To be honest, it's been a little disappointing this this year. Um, I think there's a lack of transparency between the you know, things that can happen and accountability for like the, some of the stuff that goes on. Um, like, for example, like last year we spent I don't even know how much money on the the video people. Right. And we still haven't heard anything about it. Um, I'll give you a quick update: is that we had a meeting with them this week. And we're getting them back into helping us with some of it. And also, okay. our video team is going to have a hard copy of it now to where. Um, so Max Vincent is like the best video oh, yeah. guy that NCD has. But anyway, he's getting a hard copy shipped to him. Sweet. And hopefully that speeds up the process. But um, definitely a lot of people dropped the ball. Our whole content team dropped the ball on that and everyone got busy. But yeah. Um, our goal is to start getting some of that content out because, yeah, it's uh, unfortunate that a lot of it hasn't been seen by the public yet, and it's yeah. been so long. But because that would have been a fantastic tool after all that exposure we had. Like, oh yeah, we could have gotten, I feel like, a lot more done after right. all those yeah. eyes were on us for a while. Yeah, no, it's definitely uh, something we're all a little bit frustrated and, and want to make yeah. the most out of still. So, but yeah. Anyway, continue on. Yeah, um, let's see. I mean, the Goat Tape deal, awesome. I love that. Um, it's nice to have our own branded stuff. That's cool again. Right. Uh, I know we did it when what, Elite was around. That was awesome. Loved it. Um, and then, let's see. Stay in, uh, the women's team, our nationals, I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty disappointed. It's its own nationals. Um, I think there was a chance to really use the exposure if, like, Michigan State and Ohio State makes a run. That's going to get a lot of eyeballs on the on the stream. We put their championship game in front of our championship game. That could have led to so much potential teams joining the league. So um, you're you're saying you wish that the women's division and open were all, were both the same weekend? I do. Yes. 
Because gotcha. not only that, like our team now, our women's team, I don't know how many of them can come to our nationals now. Because it's yeah back to back weekends. The funds Someone... just aren't there. It's just right to me. It feels like a short sighted decision. Yeah, I I'll uh, I 100 percent see what where you're coming from. I would I'm, my only point would be a lot of women. A handful of women in the NCDA are crucial members of, of their um, open team or pinch team, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So yeah. there was definitely the um, the friction of they wouldn't be able to do both or it would be an issue with um, with that, which I'm, I'm sure you at least understand that part. Yeah. The, the question sure. is, at some is point, it will it like, get to that point? Is it worth like... I'm assuming, let's say, the Nebraska, one Nebraska girl is probably not going to go to women's nationals now. Is it worth that growth and having them experience that to me? That's a really, really good point is on the one side, you have women's players that would, would have to balance playing pinch and playing women's. And mm -hmm. I think that in an ideal world, we can find a schedule that works out to where they can do both. But the yeah. whole um, safety issue and stuff definitely comes up um, when that conversation happens. Um, again, I'm not taking that side or anything because they're, you know, on the other side, you have just what you're saying. There's women at on each club that potentially aren't going to make the trip now to women's nationals, yeah. um, whereas they're going to be at regular nationals. And um, but then, then again, they aren't on a team. The question is, are, are you allowing uh, like mashup teams to play at, at women's nationals? And, and there's so many different moving parts. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I, I think uh, two teams with right. two full teams. I'm, I'm hearing that. I don't know if I want to spoil this. I think Illinois might be able to put together a women's team. That's oh, what that's I'm hearing. Awesome. Uh, I wouldn't say count on it, but there's yeah. potential for that. So I'm, I'm excited for that. Okay. Um, but anyway, I, I totally think that you have uh, valid points and opinion there. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just from our end because I, you know, I know our women are pretty disappointed in it. Right, um, yeah. Because we've been talking about this whole year, our whole program's a one program, and now half our team, or not half our team, but that whole side of the team can't. Yeah, that's, that's that. really frustrating. You, like, I would just say consider, for example, that the Akron women, there's definitely some of them that are, are super important pieces. Yeah, on, for sure. On their team, so then, are they are they just going to be exhausted arms on both? You know, like there was that side of it that definitely would people had to consider too. So, I think it's a discussion that can't just be shut down. This is the way we're doing it forever. I think that we need to reopen that discussion next year um, yeah. and figure out a way that because there are loads of benefits, like you're saying, to having them on the same weekend. Um, yeah just from promotion, from the uh, participation standpoint. And um, honestly, if you look at other sports, I, I always bring it back to Ultimate Frisbee because it's one that is a sport that is really similar to us, but farther ahead. Um, the way that they do it, they have it the same weekend. Um, and it's that's just the way it is. But I think uh, we have to find a way around women that are playing in both and being yeah. able to continue to give them the opportunity to play in both without it feeling like an afterthought for them um, yeah. but also not allowing um all of those other women that might not get the chance to otherwise for them to become just thrown off to the side so yeah yeah I mean, anyway. yeah we're still scrambling and trying to make it work so that we can bring them but i just don't know yep. it definitely yep. cuts down on how many of them can attend internationals now yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely a discussion that needs to continue to stay open. I, I, I totally see both sides of it. Yeah. Um, and maybe at some point, I think they can get to their, their own weekend. I just don't think it's it just doesn't make sense to me right now. To be honest. It's tough. I actually we'll we'll close this topic out here in a sec. I actually think that long term, we're going to have a better shot at it being the same weekend. Okay. Um, once we get more women's clubs that I guess once we have more clubs that are of the mold and makeup that Michigan State is right now. Mm -hmm. But right now it's, I mean, clubs are small and also like you have, yeah, there's a lot of things that are at play. You have women that have been playing pinch for years. 
um, and that's like their main thing right now. So you and you can't, yeah, like you have to allow those those women to be able to play their pinch tournament. Yeah, um, but can we can we find a way to fit it all into one weekend? Who knows? Maybe NCDA is going to be a three day nationals at some point. I was pushing for that a long time ago, but I don't know if that's the case. Yeah, if that's going to happen. But anyway. Definitely a lot of uh, opinions on that, I'm sure. Uh, other things with, with the NCDA, where you see it, growth of the league, all of that. Um, any other thoughts? No, I'm excited. I mean, I think we have a great platform. I think we have a lot of potential to continue to grow. We just have to capitalize on the moments. Like, obviously, yep. with Beck being on the board, I heard more things than most people have. And I think you just need to capitalize on a lot more of what's presented to us. Yeah, big time. I definitely definitely think we are an untapped potential still um, in a lot of ways. And the more staff that we have, the better it, the more likely it is that we get to that point. And the more coaches that we have, the more likely we are to get to that point. The more yeah. players well, that... Well, coaching for, as you said, more coaching. I, I think the more... Oh, yeah. Well, I guess my, my stance would just be the more clubs that have coaches the more likely they are to become stable programs that then are producing more players that then are you know growing and, and improving the sport and all that so it just it's a snowball effect yeah but. well i actually don't know so i'm torn i don't know i feel like not everyone should be a coach in this league um, that's fair that's totally fair like for me i invest a lot of my time not in non dodgeball stuff in these guys, these guys' lives, like I want to make sure I'm providing a, a good example and like setting them up past their college life. So I don't really feel like all coaches are there for that. I feel like they're there to play dodgeball, and I don't think that helps the, the program. Um, I'd love to see more people invested in their their players, their program, and just building it up more. Um, so what what it, what it seems like. Coaching. <laughs> Yeah, what it seems like you're saying is the one foot in, one foot out method is is not truly benefiting a program yeah. to the extent that it could if someone it's, goes all in on coaching. Uh, to put it quite frankly, uh, plainly, it's, um, they're there to play dodgeball and build their egos when they could have a major influence on young kids' lives. Like, I, I, take it very seriously that I'm keeping up with my players. I'm checking in on them. I'm sorry, that as well. Um, like these are 18 year old kids moving out of their homes for the first time. Um, especially early in the fall, they don't have friends. They don't have anything yet. You can provide a lot more to them than just dodgeball. Right. And that's not to say all coaches are doing that. I don't want to say that at all. I know. Definitely, like yeah. West are great, great coaches. Like, um, but it's not across the board. <laughs> yeah, um, I wonder if if the NCDA or if uh, current coaches um, that want to help with this could put together sort of a, a playbook and in sort of cheat sheet in, in terms of the way that you do things. Um, it, that can be a resource for future coaches because I, I mean, part of it might be people just want to go and get free dodgeball. And I yes. think that that's definitely the case. I think that's in a way getting alumni to just show up and play dodgeball does help the quality of practices. And there is yeah. a benefit to that, but the, the whole, if, if you are coaching in, in um, your, whatever your role happens to be, I think that then CDA could create a better resource for, people that are looking into becoming coaches in terms of this is how you should approach it, or this is how a handful of other people did. Mm -hmm. Because right now I think that we have people that are one foot in one foot out. Maybe they're yeah. um, scared of stepping on toes too, because this is at the end of the day. And I think you understand this obviously is it's a college club still mm -hmm. and the students are running it. And yep. it's, it's a question of, how do you, how do I mend or how do I blend myself into that as a coach where I'm not um, taken away from that and their uh, development as, as uh, student athletes in a club sport. 
yeah. while also like, benefiting and also having that authoritative authoritative um, figure being the coach, you know? Yeah. So it's a tough balance. I think that that's something that some people have nailed it down really well. But the question is, how do we scale that to be everywhere? And can yes. the, the coaches that currently are doing that put together a cheat sheet or sort of just help uh, get other coaches to be, to get to that point? Because I think you're right. I think that you see the coaches that are that are going all in potentially that that are um, helping a program more than you know someone that's just going to practice. And maybe that's all that they can commit to. And if it is, so be it. But yeah. Um, you can't just go over and practice, yeah. start beaming kids and leave for two hours and just not think about them for the rest of the week. Although that, that benefits the competition at practice, but you're right. Nothing more beyond that. Yeah. So totally understand where you're coming from. Interesting. Okay. Um, should we move to the next topic then? For sure. Let's talk more about Michigan State women's in Becca's back there somewhere. You don't have to drag her in if you don't want to, but I want to hear your take. Michigan State's women's program, how, how it's looking, and um, because like a year and a half ago, that that didn't exist. And now, yeah. uh, I don't know who, who has a larger club. Is it Akron's women or is it Michigan State? I think it's probably pretty close. I have no idea how much Akron I has, but either. I think we have eight, 17 girls now. Okay. And we actually have two new people coming this week, so um we're looking good um i took a step back from it because we have our daughter daughter now so um can't be at dodgeball four nights of the week so <laughs> um but becca and bryce have done a fantastic job with that team um we're led by <laughs> we're led by our uh our captains um ali and ashlyn work really hard to get them um on the same page and just working hard uh they do more cardio than our team does so um it's good um they're learning they at practice they do like sprints at practice or what do you mean well both that? both our teams do sprints um they're doing dedicated like 30 minutes of it yeah wow or something like that is it i don't know but they do like this cat and mouse game for a while they do i don't know more rain than i could do <laughs> wow yeah. respect yeah, so, but no, they're, they've done a good job building the team, continuing to recruit throughout the year um, and implementing strategy and trying to teach these girls how to play. Um, a bunch of them were at MDC. They love the environment and they're fully in now. Oh, like rookies? Uh, just the whole like, women's teams. Okay, yeah, yeah. Interesting. And then what's your, uh, what's your nationals take? Who's winning that for women's? It's gotta be us. We gotta keep working. <laughs> we, we got. We're not there yet. Akron's beat us. I'm pretty, pretty sure every time. But yeah. we got uh, two months. Is it? Yep. We'll we'll do Almost our best exactly. to get there. Yeah. I'm excited to see where it goes and um, how many teams can emulate what Michigan State and Akron are doing. Because I don't know. We'll see. Maybe we yeah. look back in ten years and Michigan State and Akron are just the best programs still. But who knows? It's so early. It's it's yeah. uh, so much potential. We just need buy-in from all the other schools, too, to actually recruit it. I mean, we, we push it, but we can't force it on them. We just need the buy-in, which is another reason they should have been at the same nationals, if you ask me. But I won't go back there. <laughs> no, that's that's fair. Again, that's definitely a discussion for the off season that uh, I think should be had in weighing those pros and cons. Uh, yeah, I think it probably my theory would be Michigan state having a good group of women going into this year helped immensely with the recruiting of new women. Oh yeah. Um, and it's just tough because some clubs that have one girl, um, it's, it's just so much harder than when you have seven and it's just like when it rains, it pours, Akron's going to be able to keep that club going, which is awesome. And we just yeah. need to get more past that threshold where they're able to, you know, you know, snowball effect, and all of a sudden you've got a huge yeah. club. We essentially had uh, four people recruiting for the women's team this year at our sports situation event. So yeah. now that we have all 16 of them hopefully coming back, Crazy. 17 coming back. None are seniors? Uh, are any seniors? No. No seniors. Holy cow. 
So <laughs> if they can get to this participation, have their own booth right next to us, I think it'll go a long way. That's crazy. We can get fill up the gym. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that's awesome. And that's just where every club needs to get to that at some point. It's just bound to happen. Um, yeah. But they have to I'm sure it feels good to be one of the early adopters of it. Okay. Anyway, let's, let's get to these. Uh, I don't know how long we've been on this, but let's jump into these questions. We got a few from Ryan Ginsburg. Again, this was just the eboard chat. I asked mm -hmm. him right before this. Uh, no, he asked about role players stepping up. We already covered that. Um, if do you want to, do you have any more uh, players that you want to shout out from that standpoint? No, I think our, our whole team's working hard to get to be better in their roles. Um, yeah, and being able to step up into other roles. So, um, no one specific. It's just a team effort to push our program forward. Fair. Here's a good one. Why does everyone on Michigan State wear hats? I think I said this on the stream. I think Michigan State leads the league in, in players that wear hats. Yep. I'll, no, I have no idea. To be honest, I hate hats. There's so many times where, like, your arm will hit your hat off and you'll get called out. It drives me nuts. But if they're comfortable and it helps them play well, then so be it. Maybe we'll ban hats. Maybe I'll propose that rule. I don't know. <laughs> I'll if Michigan yeah. State keeps winning MDC, then I'm going to have to propose something to get back at them. I don't know. <laughs> We got a Tony Stumpo question here. This is a good one. How often do you hop on the court during practices and play with the guys? Um, or, or the rest of the coaches? I'm interested to hear. Yeah, so most of the time we're on the court. Um, there are a couple focus days that we have where I'm just there strictly to coach and provide uh, guidance. Um, but most of the time we're on the court. Um, we'll stop practice, walk through something that went wrong, and kind of make sure everyone understands uh, what went wrong and how to fix it. But the best experience is playing against, you know, people that have experience and getting better. Um, like for me, I whenever I play, I throw to get caught. Um, it builds confidence. It's, uh, if I think you can catch this ball, I'm going to throw it to you. If you catch it, I'm going to throw a little harder. And it, it's, I think that shows in our catching. Um, all our coaches wow. are – um, there to help the team grow. So we're always doing stuff like that to help them. Interesting. Um, here we go. Hunter Ford says, what's the best and worst part of being a dad? And between Fido and Bearball, who's your favorite child? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's they fight over this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> who's our favorite child? Nick Bearball? Not Allie, obviously. <laughs> I'll say Nick because he's actually here right now. So, <laughs> mom might have a better, uh, different favorite child than dad too. I think that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? No, I thought no. it was Jack Gerling this whole time, but he's he's uh, out of, off the, out of the nest now. So yeah, <laughs> you don't like him as much anymore. No, he's no. I don't honestly. Back to Jack. We don't win NBC this year without him. What he helped me with wow. that half time. It's, 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 I didn't come up with it. I'm not going to take any credit for it. It was all him, Josh, and Barry. Like, we actually live there all yelling for him to stand next to him because he really? needed advice. So, wow. those guys, is he going to get a, uh, is he going to get a contract offer to be a coach? What's that? Sorry, I. I was going to say, is he going to get a contract offer to be a coach on the team now or what? <laughs> you know, those guys always come back and help. Um, yeah. We do our FJ versus MSU scrimmages pretty often. Um, and they're, they're just there to help and give them good competition. I see. I also have Wes jumping in my huddles for yeah. <laughs> some reason. Wes, Wes was up by the uh, classic. That's classic. <laughs> That's you know what he was doing is he was he was getting a gauge so that at nationals when since he's playing Michigan State he's gonna know what to do. Yeah. I think that's no, it was actually, all it was all to get that. So I call a timeout or whatever. I walk back in my huddle. Like he's there giving advice, calling a play. I'm like, what's the play? Call. They told me what it was. Like, okay, that's what I would call. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> no way. That's uh, funny. What was I gonna say? Yeah, no, that's that's a. Uh, classic west he was also he was up 
in the booth and he's cheering too loud. Like what he was doing is he was clapping too close to the camera. Like, <laughs> all right, you got, you got to go like a little further away so that it doesn't get all like <laughs> ring Tap audio. The <laughs> yeah, the audio was getting messed up and yeah. shaking the whole thing up there. So anyway, yeah. he moved down. And I, I love what he's uh He's uh, cooled off quite a bit from when he was here, <laughs> and he's been a great addition to my team. So I love, yeah. I love him. Right. Uh, we will round it out here with one last question, also from Hunter Ford. And this is a big one. How long do you plan on coaching for? I want to hear uh, that for each of you, uh, Becca, as well. Yeah. What's um, your plan? For quite a while, I'd assume. Um, obviously, we have our family now. It's just trying to make it work in terms of timing. Like, uh, my parents are right here, so they help watch her on dodgeball nights. So it's helpful. Um, yeah. But I mean, I'm I'm here as long as they want me here. It's like it's never about me. If they don't want me there, I won't go to there. I love that. Um, and you are one of the. You guys are are both one of the many. I think Wes is definitely part of this too. But the the movement to, uh, I think there was a time there where. Once you were a grad student, even it was like, "Hey, what are you doing? Being a part of college dodgeball? This isn't cool." Like all of that, and now it's gotten to the point. Honestly, I think alumni graduating and helping their program, like you said, buying in fully to be a good to be a a true coach. That's a like in style thing now. Like that's cool, and I think yeah. that uh, you guys have have both of you and Becca and then uh, I think Wes is a, is a huge one that needs to be shouted out for that too have really um, sparked that and I think that that movement's going to continue so I just want to applaud each of each of you for uh, for kind of starting that movement and yeah it's I think that we're going to get to the point years and years from now where there are you know old guys coaching or old yeah. women coaching the women's teams or whatever it happens to be um, and that's just going to become more and more of a norm as the, as the sport develops. But uh, I, w I just want to applaud you on being on the cutting edge of that. And it seems to be working with the streak going for Michigan State and defending a national title here in a couple months. So best of luck to, to you. Do you have any final thoughts or, or should we uh, end this here? Yeah, no, I've been with the team for a long time now. I started going to MSU practices with since I was a senior in high school. So um I'm Don't say the to, year. I, I I avoided it for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm committed. I know I left for two years to Central, but right at the end of the day, I'm a Michigan State guy. Um, yep. I'm excited to be a part of the program. Excited to help these guys um, grow on and off the court, and just really excited for our future. Love it. Well, thank you again for joining and. Uh... Yeah, we'll we'll end the podcast here. Thank you all for uh listening on.